Hey friends, welcome to Growing with Creekside. Today I have a little bit of time in the morning that I want to get a project done. And so we are going to spend some time here at the, it's actually a shade garden, currently it's in full sun. Um, we're gonna spend some time in this shade garden just doing a little bit of cleaning up, a little bit of tidying up and some fertilizing. Um, I thought this would be fun for you just to come along with me to see kind of how I maintain this space so that we can make it through, uh, finish the summer, strong in this flower bed and be uh, just a gorgeous display of color throughout the rest of the season. The reason I say I have a little bit of time, life is crazy right now. I, I mean, what's new, but right, I mean, all of us live such very full lives and our oldest is getting ready to go away to college this week. We've got construction going on. The nursery is open. We've got people coming in and out and all around. So I'm sure this will be uh, quite interesting to see who pops up in camera on this video because this is high traffic area. We're right here at the driveway. I was trying to stand in the shade just a little bit to kind of give you a little bit of perspective, right? So driveway, high traffic zone right here. You'll probably see FedEx, UPS, Amazon, you know, who knows. Um, but this is the bed that we are going to spending some time in this morning. Nothing major. We're just going to come in here and like I said, clean up a little bit. I have got hostas that have finished blooming. This is Wiggles and Squiggles and clearly Wiggles and Squiggles is finished blooming so we want to tidy her up she is all done i personally love hosta blooms some people don't which i find interesting i mean to each their own right but the reason i love them i think they're beautiful they're delicate they are very fragrant and the hummingbirds and the bumblebees love them so we've got some golden tiaras we need to do the same thing with I want to go ahead and cut back my bleeding hearts all the way to the ground. No, they are not dying. This is what bleeding hearts look like at the end of the summer. They are going dormant. So we're going to cut that back. We're going to clean up the Aurelia Sun King. There's actually two of them in here. A beautiful shade perennial but they're starting to get a little bit too big. I've been kind of slightly trimming them as the season goes on. Nothing severe, just a little tidy up because they're starting to hide the caladiums. And in the past, I have had them go to seed, which I do not want. So we're gonna just gonna come in here and tidy this up a little bit. And then we're also going to fertilize. I do have some annuals in this space. They need a little bit of a dose of a fertilizer. So I thought it would just be kind of fun to walk through this space with me. And I am going to take you along and show you exactly what I'm going to do, how I'm going to treat all the plants. And we're just going to have a fun time in the garden. Now, here we go, y'all. I am so excited about this camellia. This is my white by the gate. And this is a Japonica camellia. You can tell because it has those big, huge, beautiful leaves on it. Do you see all those gorgeous buds? I mean, it's covered in buds. I got, I think I got one flower this year off of it because of um, the Arctic blast. Even though I covered it, it just took a beating. I have been faithfully watering this thing and she is showing great promise. Big, beautiful buds on there. So excited, cannot wait. Um, I don't know if you can hear that on my mic but up in the chicken coop the girls are singing and typically that's what we call <laughs> in the chicken world that's the egg song so after a chicken lays an egg she'll sing that song and so you know she's like so proud of herself that she just laid an egg so it'll be interesting to see if we actually have an egg up there We'll check in a little bit. Emily just came down. She's like, Mom, I got an egg. So that was the second one of the day. So maybe, maybe this will be number three. We'll see. So what we're going to do is I'm just going to kind of set the camera up and I'm just going to kind of walk you through as I do things. I'm going to walk you through, show you what I'm doing and explaining. And we're just going to have a fun time in the garden this morning. Now, I will say this before we get started. Yes, I am in the full sun right now. Remember, a shade garden is four hours or less of sun. This is relatively early in the morning. I wanted to get started when it was still in the shade, but that just didn't happen. Uh, and so this gets sun for about that four hours. And then it is in afternoon, complete shade. Lunchtime, it is in the shade. We're just happened to be in it when it has the full sun on it in the morning. 
you may say, well, Jenny, why don't you just film this in the afternoon when it's, you know, in the shade? Uh, it's because I have the time right now and I don't know where this day is going to go. And that's one thing I've learned in life is I'm not going to even try to predict how my day is going to go. We're just going to go with the flow. I have time, so I'm going to do it now. Yes, it's in the full sun. Yes, it's a little toasty, but hey, what's new? Life is toasty in August in North Carolina. So set the camera up and we're going to get started. We're gonna start really simple. Um, we're gonna clean up the hostas. I noticed that my Brunner has got some foliage that has died in the center of it. It's no big deal, y'all. Just get in there and clean it up. If you're not, um, if you're not familiar with the South and our lovely hot, humid weather, sometimes this just happens, right? I mean, we had just this week, we have had days where we had dew points um, like 80 degree dew points just absolutely miserable and it's not just the dew point is that way during the day it's at night and we just have horrible horrible humidity and it's just miserable not only is it hard on us it's hard on our plants so sometimes obviously they're going to show stress it is you just deal with it it's not going to kill the plant it may make it look unsightly for a little bit but we just go with it your hostas if you um i never want to assume that anybody knows how to do something because we all learn from each other and um right this is what this is what the gardening community is about is sharing information so maybe you have cut hostas a gazillion times in your life but i could have viewers that have never cut a hosta so i want to kind of show and take any kind of fear out of that. So your hostas are gonna bloom, right? So every hosta is going to make a flower and they create these beautiful stalks and they could either be white, uh, purple, or pink, shades of those flowers on them. When they get to this point of being just stalks, we wanna go ahead and trim them back. We just wanna get the plant cleaned up so you see that beautiful foliage again. Basically, you're gonna go back as far as you can within the plant um, where you don't see that stalk and cut it don't come through and just take the tops off get the whole stalk so that you no longer see it and you just have your beautiful foliage on your plant now again talking about gardening in the south if you were to get a really up close uh, bird's eye view of this hosta you would go well jenny that's not really beautiful foliage yeah well it's august in north carolina so they have um, there's not very much slug or snail damage on here we are going to treat that uh, before we leave this space i'm going to show you how easy that is uh, so we're going to show you how to do that but also some of my tips of my leaves are a little brown and that's just simply from burn it's just hot it's humid they were absolutely stunning in the spring gorgeous and now they're showing wear and tear it'll be amazed um, you'll be amazed maybe um, if you've never kind of spent the time just a couple of you know 30 minutes in the garden doing this just makes such a difference not only in how the garden looks but how you feel about your garden because a nice neat tidy garden makes everybody feel better so that is my goal for today is just to get in here clean things up make it look a little more presentable from my perspective and um, it makes me as a gardener feel good. So I'm just gonna finish getting these hostas trimmed up and then we're gonna attack this Sun King and get it shaped up a little bit more. Aurelia Sun Kings are a fantastic perennial um, that are just provide, of course, gorgeous color, this beautiful chartreuse, kind of yellowy, beautiful, bright, bold color for your shade garden. This bed is not on irrigation. <laughs> However, I do have this window box, right? And I do have to water the window box. So when I water the window box, that water comes down and waters these Sun Kings. There are two right here. Um, I had no idea that they were going to be as happy as they are in this space when I planted them a couple of years ago. These are probably uh, four years old in this space. And so obviously a very, very happy plant. And I do love them. I don't really regret planting two because if I had planted one, 
I don't know which way. Maybe I just would have put one over here, but it is what it is. I am not moving them because they're very happy. Now, earlier in the spring, I did come in here and prune a little bit more aggressively as far as I knew that it, we were still very much in the active growing phase. Now that we are in the middle of August, I'm going to be very selective of how I prune because I don't want to have any like open bare spots in here. All I'm doing is simply finding tall pieces and going down to the stalk and I'm cutting it back. This is, um, you're not going to hurt the plant. Remember, if you're in doubt, cut off a little bit because you can always cut off more but you can't put it back on. So it's better to be a little bit more um, on the conservative side. And then if you look at it and go, no, you know what? I could go just a little bit deeper then, then you can certainly do that. It's kind of like hair. You can cut more off, but you can't add it back on because my goal here is just to kind of shape it up a little bit. Here, I've got a, a leaf that has a little bit of burn. So I'm just gonna take that one little piece off like that because it's got some burn on it from the sun, sun damage, no big deal. But I want my caladiums to be um, nice and kind of the peeking out and the star of the show here. The uh, one downside is you got to wiggle and finagle your way back in here. People ask me a lot if I worry about snakes. I don't. We don't have any... Um, really poisonous snakes here is very rare. We could have copperheads. They don't, we've rarely seen them. And if we do see them, they're down by the creek. We have black snakes, which are um, quote, good snakes, meaning they're not venomous and they control the rodent population. Um, they are very friendly. They're docile. They're not gonna hurt us. If there was a snake in here, trust me, I have scared it way more than it's gonna scare me and um, it'll just slither away and um, all will be well. So I don't have to worry about that. These pieces that are closest to the caladiums, just gonna come in, take those off. See how it has just a nice gentle shape? If you weren't watching me prune this Sun King, you would not know that it had been pruned, which is what I want. I do not want a severe pruning at this point in the season. And we're just coming in and shaping it up tidying it up a little bit. Now, speaking of caladiums, that is lemon blush. And lemon blush is a caladium rated for the shade. It has done really well here, getting the morning sun and then afternoon shade. Very nice and vigorous. If you are a follower of Creekside, you might remember that in the spring, I planted around the base of the hay rack, window box, whatever you want to call it, um, some of the Double Delight Primrose Begonias. I have them in the other containers. I think one, the Caladiums can handle this sun, but the Begonias at this point in the season, the sun was too much and or the Sun King was coming up and uh, they, they perished. They're no longer with us. The plants are still like, I haven't pulled them out because it's hard for me to get in there. I haven't pulled them out, but they're just gone. But honestly, I don't care because they were beautiful in the spring when this was growing up and you could see them. They were gorgeous, stunning. Now that this is nice and full, like you wouldn't, it just looks like the caladiums are coming out of the Sun King. So I'm fine with it. You know what? It is what it is. They were annuals. We're not going to worry ourselves too much about that. So, Sun King is pretty much done. There's one little piece that I'm trying to stretch. Now, I can definitely go in there and trim up and kind of thin out any of those caladium uh, leaves that look a little ratty. But honestly, I think it might be easier because I can't Jenny's short. I'm only, you know, 5'2", five, 5'3". Five, I can't quite reach that without breaking the Sun King. I don't want to do that. But what I can do is, um, I know it sounds funny, but I can go through the kitchen and open the window and kind of lean that way and clean it up. So I'll do that later. It's fine. Now what I want to do is I want to show you about the bleeding hearts. Because let's talk about bleeding hearts. People get so freaked out 
over their bleeding hearts this time of year because they think that they're dying. They're not. Let me show you and explain why. Hopefully you can, you can see me okay right here. Uh, so we are going to prune back these bleeding hearts because it is middle of August and bleeding hearts are most definitely going to be a cool weather perennial. They do the best in cooler temperatures. They're going to be one of the first things that you see pop out of your garden, one of the first blooms in your garden um, in the springtime. When the heat and the humidity hits, they are like, I'm done. Check you later. I'll see you next spring. So this is what my, uh, I have two bleeding hearts. I'm down here on the ground. This is what my bleeding heart currently looks like. If you didn't know better, you're like, oh my gosh, it is dead. It is dying. It looks awful. The other one is just right on the other side of the hydrangea. So what we're going to do, y'all, we're just going to go ahead <laughs> and take it out of its misery and we're going to come in and we are going to simply cut it all the way back to the ground everywhere that there is a stalk that is coming out of the ground we're going to cut it just like that and there are just a couple of little extras right here that we're going to cut boom right so this is where my roots still are because that's the beautiful thing about perennials right we care about the roots more than the foliage. This is where my plant is, but we've just gone ahead and eliminated it. I promise it is alive. I promise next spring it is gonna come back more glorious and more beautiful than ever. And it's gonna be huge. But for now, we're just gonna get rid of it. And then I'm gonna go ahead and go do the other one right on the other side. And then I'm gonna show you from looking at it from the driveway side, you're not even gonna notice that these things are gone. All right, let me show you what it looks like uh, from this perspective, uh, looking back here. <laughs> My garden is growing a German Shepherd. <laughs> I don't know what she's doing back there. But anyway, right where she is, that is where one bleeding heart is. And then right here on the other side is where the other bleeding heart is. So you, you know, you're looking at this from the whole perspective and you would never know that anything is missing. And I planned the garden that way. So when I planted this garden, I wanted it to be because I knew that bleeding hearts were going to do this. I wanted it to be in August, September, October, when you look at this bed that there's not an obvious hole right there. Also on the flip side, in the springtime when my hydrangea is just now, you know, starting to put on some, some leaves, then you've got this big, beautiful uh, bleeding heart on each side of the hydrangea that is just filled in and has a gorgeous foliage, gorgeous flowers all right here. So there you go. Don't be afraid with your bleeding hearts. Just go ahead and cut them to the ground and then there you go. So the garden is all tidied up. Everything is neat and tidy uh, as best as it can be. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and fertilize. We are going to use our water soluble fertilizer, proven winter's water soluble fertilizer on all my flowering annuals. Perennials, I only feed one time a year and that is coming out of winter going into spring. So that could be like late February, early March. Plant tone. That's all I use on these perennials. If you want to start to get a little specific on your hydrangeas, you can use rose tone. Rose tone is great for uh, hydrangeas because it is that uh, flowering shrub has the same needs as a rose does. Camellias. Camellias are acid loving shrubs. They like holly tone. But if you're in doubt and you're not sure what to use and you can only buy one fertilizer for your perennials, trees and shrubs, by plant tone. It is like the Swiss Army knife of fertilizers and it will take care of everything. So today, are we going to fertilize them? Nope. Are we going to fertilize our flowering annuals? Yep, we sure are. So I'm going to gather up my hose, fertilizer, watering can, and I'm going to show you how easy it is to do it. Fertilizing your annuals is one of the best thing that you can do for your flowering annuals to give them the longest, happiest season that they possibly can have full of flowers. So I only use the Proven Winners water soluble fertilizer. Super simple to use because in the container you will have um, two bags of your granular fertilizer. So these lovely blue bags, right? So nice blue bags filled with granulars and then this one's almost empty. You will also have in there 
a lovely blue scoop. So the scoop is really uh, the best way, of course, to use your fertilizer. You're gonna do one scoop of fertilizer per gallon of water. I have got my trusty watering can right here. This is a two gallon watering can. So I'm gonna do two scoops of fertilizer for one can of water because this is a two gallon watering can. I like to put the fertilizer in first. That way when you add the water, it automatically kind of starts to mix it up and dissolve in there. And then you're just gonna simply water like you normally would if it were, you know, you're watering your annuals. You don't have to worry about doing them too much. Just get them some food in there. If you can do it every week, that's amazing. And you're gonna have gorgeous plants. If sometimes you're like me, you can't quite remember to do it every week or you just time doesn't allow, do it when you can, right? Some fertilizer is better than no fertilizing. Fertilize your plants, but you will be amazed at how much of the difference that you see when you do fertilize your plants. It just makes a huge, huge difference in the color of the foliage, the number of blooms you have, and how long it prolonged, how long your season is prolonged. So what we're gonna do is just do that. Um, so what I have in here that I am gonna fertilize, I'm gonna go ahead and fertilize all of my hay racks, my window boxes that have the lemon blush caladiums in there. And then two of them still have the double delight primrose begonia. Caladiums are not heavy feeders by any means, neither are begonias, but I haven't done it in quite a long time. So this is the perfect time to do it. I have the Endless Illumination Broalia, that beautiful blue annual down there. Um, they will respond really well to being fertilized. And then I have the Rocapuco Double Impatience. Impatience as a general rule, don't like a lot of fertilizer. Again, it's been a long time since they have been fertilized. They will be fine. Um, sometimes if you over fertilize impatience, they stop blooming. Not worried about it here because I haven't done it in a very long time. And then at the very, very end at the sidewalk, I have two containers of the Supertunia Mini Vista Whites that we're gonna do those too. So we're just gonna knock out some fertilizer and get these babies fed. I have one last piece of advice, uh, one more little trick up my sleeve that I want to share with you today. So we talked about how uh, snails and slugs can be a problem in a shade garden, just because it typically is a little bit more wet, it's a little bit more damp. They certainly do love the hostas. What I've been using for the past couple of years is a um, slug and snail bait. This particular brand is Garden Safe. I buy it online from Amazon. I believe you can also get this particular brand in big box stores. I know Espuma makes one of these. Um, there's a bunch of different companies that will make this. As long as it is a slug and snail bait, then you are good. And this is certified organic. There we go. You can barely see it there at the top where it says Omri listed. That means it is nice and safe to use. Anything where you see that OMRI listed, that is a great organic solution. Goes through rigorous testing so you can use it. This is safe to use um, around pets and children. Um, 
all sorts of things your vegetables there's no delay time as far as when you put it down and if you harvest crops with it it is perfectly fine so it is um, little pellets it reminds me kind of like of like chicken food or rabbit food and you just simply throw it out so let me just kind of I'm doing this one-handed y'all so we're gonna do the best we can do so you can see here I have a little handful of it and what I like to do instead of like just throwing it right on top of the leaves I like to try to come in like underneath the hosta and then just shake it down on the ground and so you just kind of come in periodically and do that and you can do that throughout the flower bed so that is a great way to control the snails and slugs in your garden therefore they don't eat your plants it is a uh, it's a great thing to do and i've noticed that i did it really religiously for like two years as far as um, every couple of weeks i would come out here and do it and i have had very little damage this year from them and i have not had to reapply um, nearly as regularly as i have in the past so that is hopefully that will help some of you give you a big overview here of the flower bed as it is finished it just looks a little neater a little tidier my annuals have been fed so they will be nice and happy continue to give me lots of flowers for the rest of the season pretty straightforward y'all um, it was great to get this project done in my mind's eye at least it looks a little neater and a little tidier so therefore we are good to go Hope you have found this fun and informative and inspirational. Um, get out there in your garden, even if you can only get out there for a few minutes. Do something, pull a weed, put down some slug and snail bait, fertilize a plant, right? I know it's hard, especially for my fellow folks who are dealing with heat, humidity, and high temperatures, um, and we're not even the worst of it. My, I'm looking at you, Texas. I don't know how you're doing it. God bless you. Just hang in there, sweet friends. All right, as always, we appreciate you. Have a great day. See you in the next video. Bye.